Hey, it's Alex from Board Game Co. and it's kind of a light week as far as big Kickstarters go. This week and next are theoretically light weeks as far as gigantic 3,000 backers, $500,000 Kickstarters. We seem to have hit that peak, which means it's catch-up time. It's catch-up time and all these kinds of videos, these lists, these things, these conversations that I want to have because at the end of the day, I mean, this channel is very Kickstarter focused. Do not get me wrong. I'm not going to try to deny that, pretend that I'm not trying to avoid it. It's, it's Kickstarter focused for a reason. But I also don't like those weeks when it's like, you know, an entire week full of Kickstarter. I like having conversations, I like having topics, I like having lists. And with how empty the next two weeks are as far as gigantic Kickstarters, it means we can catch up on things. And then I realize as I'm saying this, that the first thing I'm catching up on is, of course, a Kickstarter-focused topic. It is what it is. Nonetheless, this week is actually pretty good. If you look at the lineup for this week, most things are not Kickstarter, which... I guess pretty good as a relative term, depending on what kind of content you're here for. In any case, let's go ahead. And by the way, if you missed it, check out my confirmation bias video about why Everdell is better than Wingspan. Great subject, whether you agree or disagree. In fact, it's often better when you disagree. It's just it's just more, more of a conversation that way. It develops more. In any case, the last time I did this video, I did my Kickstarter backlog, which was a video list in which I was going through all my Kickstarters that I have in the queue, things coming in. And I don't know the full amount offhand, but it's somewhere in the 50 to 60 range. Although, in this last list, since I did this a month ago, October 20th, four of these have since come in. I did Tidal Blade, Super Fantasy Brawl, well, you can read the screen, Assassin's Creed, Dwellings of Eldevel, Ignite, Val and Villainy, Bloodborne, Wild Ascent, Tainted Grail, Alter Quest, Kingdom Rush, etc. Now, Tainted Grail is one that I did two-wave shipping on. It's something I would no longer do anymore, just given the nature of content creation, that because I'm a content creator, now I need to have that stuff in wave one so I can review it, so I can unbox it. So, practically speaking, it's things people want to see, and so I can justify that extra $10 expense or whatever it is, uh, possibly more, whatever it ends up costing. In terms of this list above, so far, uh, Tidal Blades has since come in and it was sold before it even made its way to me. Basically, I, I was interested in the game, but I have too many games that I want to hit the table. And so Tidal Blades, I already sold uh, right away as soon as I possibly could. I'm still interested in getting my hands on it one day, but the, the hype and the fear and the FOMO and all those things, I figured I'll take my opportunity to get uh, to basically get my money back while I still can. Super Fantasy Brawl has come in, and I love that game. Oh my gosh, I am really enjoying Super Fantasy Brawl. So that's a win there. Dwellings of Eldervale arrived today. The day I'm filming this, Dwellings of Eldervale arrived, and I'm excited. I'm very excited. The unboxing was fun. I did an unboxing, which you haven't seen yet. You'll see the unboxing this Saturday, probably. Uh, but in any case, uh, yeah, I'm excited about Dwellings of Eldervale. Very hyped for it. Hoping it'll be great. Awesome. Valor and Villainy is going to be shipping shortly. Us is uh, Alter Quest. Uh, sorry, Us is Queen Kingdom Rush. Both those are shipping shortly. And lastly, we have Alter Quest, which arrived already. I already did an unboxing. And it is set up on my table. By the time you watch this video, I may or may not have already played my first game. Uh, today was a busy day. I got the opportunity to get all my videos done for the week, or most of them, because now I'm not doing Kickstarter content this week. It doesn't have to be as time-sensitive as usual. And with that, you know, recap of the last video, let's jump into this one. Starting with one that should have been in the last video, which is the Everrain. The Everrain was not in the last video because of the fact that I didn't actually back this one myself, but this one, along with Wild Ascent, will be my oldest Kickstarters that I have been waiting on for the longest time. Uh, because this wasn't in my Kickstarter, you know, list when I log into Kickstarter, I forgot about this one. And this one is one that I did a trade for shortly after the Kickstarter. Basically, I wanted the Kickstarter, but I held off. And then someone else wanted a bunch of games for me, and he had he's trying to trade his pledge. So I basically traded for an Everrain pledge, which is good because I did want it, but also I had held off. So I'm not sure I'm not sure whether trading for it was responsible or irresponsible. Not backing it when I was on the fence, that was responsible. Trading for it when I was on the fence. I don't know what we want to call that one. But the Everrain basically is a 1-4 to four player cooperative storage of an exploration game in a world on the brink of annihilation. The, the theme of this game is you're piloting a ship around the water. It's very Cthulhu madness driven. I don't know if it's actually Cthulhu as a theme, but it has that, that, that aspect. It has tentacly monsters and gigantic elder ones, kind of. So I don't know how invested it is in that theme, but it definitely has some association. This is going to be from Grimlord Games, most well known for Village Attacks. That's their other big box Kickstarter. Lots of people love that one. I tried that one, and in fact, I played it like eight times which is certainly not a small amount of times to play a game. But nonetheless, at the end of the day, Village Attacks is one that I eventually moved on from. I just prefer uh, other games in that genre to, to that game. But it's good. It's a solid game. I really enjoy Village Attacks. Uh, so I'm excited for the Everrain. I'm excited to see what happens. I'm less excited about the fact that it's two years. Like, I mean, is it two years? I think it's been, yeah, it's two years now, which means it's a year that we expected and another year that is 
falls into the overdue category. Uh, so it's definitely late. This is the latest one other than Wild Descent that I am waiting for. I'm fine waiting for it as long as it eventually shows up. I mean, it is Grimlord Games, which is does introduce some confidence. We're still getting regular updates as far as to the, the stuff, the 71 updates total. The miniatures are less why I backed this game. I was just more intrigued by the gameplay, the story. It looked it looked fun. It looks interesting. And coming from someone who made Village Attacks, even though Village Attacks was not a game for me in the end, nonetheless, whenever someone makes a solid game, I, sometimes I recognize that the game is solid, but it's just not for me for a variety of reasons. And that means I'm already interested in their next games because just because one game wasn't for me doesn't mean the rest won't be. So very interested, very excited, a little intimidated by the campaign stuff. In general, campaign, the word campaign nowadays just scares me more and more. It's harder for me to justify campaign games. The first thing that... As soon as I see a Kickstarter campaign, well, Kickstarter campaign, as soon as I see a Kickstarter project with the word campaign in it, that is already a reason not to back. It's not that I won't back it, it's a reason not to back. So, for instance, recently, uh, USS Freedom is one that I am backing because I really enjoyed it, and the campaign seems more narrow in scope. 36 missions, I think I'm going to run through the 36 missions and probably never play it again, or if I die early, maybe do whatever. But, like, 36 is a lot of games, so unless I really love it, I anticipate going through it and then trading it off. Uh, in terms of, but yeah, point is, point is campaign is not a deal breaker, but it certainly is an intimidation factor. And with that, with the Everrain covered, let's move on to the next one, which is Trudvang. Now, this is going to be the first of many on this list that I have successfully done, successfully, that I have done videos on in terms of, of why I backed it or should you back it or after the fact. Basically, a few of these on this list are going to be videos I already covered. And so those I'll go into a little less depth because you may have heard my full thoughts on it. But overall, Trudvang is one that has had its own delays. And this is also going to end up being pretty delayed. Uh, this may end up beating Everrained or Wild Descent by the time all is said and done in terms of how m delayed the project was. Uh, fortunately, I never backed Solomon Kane. That's like, that is the the mother of all delayed projects that we still expect to see. When you when you have a delayed project, at a certain point, it moves into, you're never going to get a territory. Uh, fortunately, the delayed projects I have are not yet there. Both Wild Descent and, and uh, Everrain are s supposedly coming soon, so hopefully I will get them. And for Trudvang, I have no no, no, what's it called? No concerns whatsoever. Could be wrong, could be horrifically wrong, but I believe I will get this one, and this is one that I'm just intrigued by. I'm intrigued by the legend system. I know I just talked about campaign, and that's part of the reason I'm allergic to campaigns is not just the campaigns I have, but the campaigns I have coming, and that's going to include Trudvang. Trudvang is going to have to fight an uphill battle to show me how amazing it is for me to pull it out and play it and play it, and play it. But it does have that legend system, and it does look incredibly accessible. So if it manages to be accessible, while managing to give me different gameplay feels, while managing to keep me invested in the story, in the campaign, in the evolution of the board, in the growth of my characters, then I'll keep it. Otherwise, I will sell it and move on quickly. At the end of the day, come on, games. I love come on, games as a company, but their campaign games, like, for instance, Rise of Moloch is the closest I think I have to a come on campaign game as of now, and that one's going to have a hard time. It, that's not true. I was going to say I have a hard time staying on my shelf, but I love Rise of Moloch. Uh, but even that one, that, that one you have, you play basically between three and, like, ten missions at a time, which is not overwhelming. At the same time, it has been over a year since I pulled Rise of Moloch out. So it is it is a tough space to fit into. But basically, Trudvang, the main thing that pulled me in with Trudvang is that legend system, is that simple gameplay, the unique miniatures. I am very excited for this to come. I don't know when it will show up. And sadly, I fall into the category of when they said, hey, a year-long delay to revise whatever. I don't know if they said year-long. When they said there's going to be additional delays uh, to revise things and clean things up, I was not concerned about it. I was like, great. Lots of things to get out of the way. I will happily wait because I will lie to myself and pretend that by the time this does show up, I still won't have a backlog. Of course, I'll have a backlog. It is the nature of the, the FOMO beast that we ride together. That would be Trudvang. Moving on from there, we have Time of Legends Destiny, which is another one I did a Should You Back on. Uh, this is one that I actually went back and forth on. It's really what, what pulled me in on this one in the end is the amount of people who were over the hill obsessed with this game. That's what pulled me in in the end. At the end of the day, doing the Kickstarter, I was a dollar pledge, and I... I I basically, I, I voted in all these stories to try to create the scenarios. This is going to be an app-driven game, which is already my first giant warning flag away from this game, given my own personal preferences, not given the ecosphere as a whole. App-driven games do well. See Mansions of Madness. See Lord of the Rings Journeys of Middle-earth. App-driven games are not a problem in terms of the ratings they can achieve, but both those games were major duds for me, so they have been a problem for me. Uh, in terms of this game, this may well end up being in the exact same category, but the massive amount of ratings talking about how good this game was, and I did initially like Chronicles of Crime. At the end of the day, I moved on from Chronicles of Crime because it became too annoying to constantly 
hit and see the same people again and again. So I did eventually move away from Chronicles of Crime. That being said, I, I liked it kind of. And so if this manages to be that without being as tediously annoying as having to go through the same sequences again and again as you point your phone at the QR code and go back and forth, if it manages to be more exploratory and more rewarding, then it could very well be, you know, something I'm interested in. I'm seeing over here, campaign one and done scenarios. I can't remember if I knew that, but I'm happy to see that because I'd, I'd like to try the one and done scenarios before investing in a gigantic campaign in a system I don't even know if I like. So color me intrigued for a time of Legends Destinies. Um, no regrets here. At the end of the day, same thing as usual. I will try it. I will either like it or I will move on from it and try the next one. From there, we go to Oath Sworn into the Deep Wood, another one that I did a full should you back it or why I backed it on. And this is one that I went all in on. And it's one that I am intimidated by because it is gigantic narrative driven stuff and it doesn't look as accessible as as uh, the Trudvang. It doesn't look as accessible. It looks like it's far more involved, far more rewarding at the same time. But this is going to have a, a bit of a map movement as well as a boss battling situation going on, a navigational element to the terrain. It looks simultaneously incredibly appealing. It looks incredibly rewarding. It looks like it's going to be in-depth and deep and blah 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 and all those good words. But it also looks like it might be intimidating. Uh, recently, I had the privilege to play, uh, play Aeon's End Trespass. And that is one that Aeon's End? Aeon's Odyssey Trespass. Aeon Tra Aeon's Trespass Odyssey, that's the one. ATO. And I liked it, but I was also intimidated by it. I got to play a few tutorials and I eventually had to move it, move it on and send it back because... I couldn't give myself the amount of time it needed to really play a ton of the content, and as much as I liked what I did experience, I was intimidated by the overall system. And this is a me problem. This is not a you problem. Campaign games are going to be problems for different types of people. Uh, it's going to be a problem for people who like to have all the games. That's me. It's going to be a problem for content creators who have to be on top of all the games. Also me. So I am just not the target audience for these epic, sprawling campaign games, and I am being more selective about them now. I'm still excited about the ones I have coming. But I'm prepared to make hard decisions. I'm prepared to make hard... I'm thinking of letting Gloomhaven go right now. Keep, I, want, I want to keep Jaws of the Lion. And maybe we'll talk about Frosthaven down the road. I don't know. But I can't see how I can justify owning Gloomhaven or, or Frosthaven when I haven't even finished Jaws of the Lion yet. So I, I, I'm making all kinds of hard decisions around campaign games. And part of that, it starts by not getting new ones. The ones I already have coming... We'll have to we'll have to see. It, it, it just doesn't make sense. I mean, until I, I have to retire first, there's no way I can actually keep up this this system. It's good problems to have. Not complaining. I have a whole video planned on this aspect because somebody once said like, well, it's not their fault that. Of course, it's not their fault. I'm not blaming campaign games. They might be for you. They're great. But there is an accessibility issue there. There is an accessibility issue in the sense that a campaign game requires a greater commitment, no differently than a $300 price tag requires a, d a different commitment. Games have all sorts of things that make them accessible or less accessible, and a campaign game does make it less accessible to specific people. Then we go to Zombicide 2nd Edition, which <clears throat> has a campaign. <laughs> uh, so this is one where I actually am not worried about the campaign. This is one where I assume it will be more like Cthulhu Death May Die for me, which is... It, this is almost this is zombicide. I love zombicide Black Plague. I was disappointed by Invader. I'm at the point where I'm probably going to get rid of Invader. I, I I I don't know. I kind of want to have a debate with somebody about Invader to have them convince me. As of right now, I'm kind of on the fence with Invader. I might get rid of that one. Second edition, I'll have to see. It may be one that I end up keeping. It may be one that I don't. I don't know where it'll play out. It'll either be as fun as Black Plague, or it'll be less fun, in which case I have to make hard decisions. Uh, they do have a campaign mode in the Zombicide, Washington, D.C., whatever it is. That one doesn't intim intimidate me as much, because Cthulhu Death May Die also has a sort of campaign, and it's incredibly accessible. I find that the lighter something is with a campaign mode, the more likely it is to get to the table. I like heavy, chunky experiences. And I like them isolated as single shots. And I, I don't mind campaign games or sequential stuff, but I want them to be more, be more accessible. That's why I'm not as worried about Zombicide or Trudvang as I am about Oathsworn. But it's not that they're better games, just the opposite. They will be less rewarding, but easier to play. And that it is, is kind of its own reward. There's a reason why Inisk frequently toes the line as being my number one game, even though Blood Rage is my number one game. And the reason Innis to me, might actually one day exceed Blood Rage is because I play it more often, it's more accessible, it has a shorter playtime. And that can push a game up in the rankings. Because, at the end of the day, the reason games exist, at least in my opinion, is to play them. And so that is a relevant factor in our decisions. But at the end of the day, super excited about Zombicide, obviously. It's Zombicide, and I, I do enjoy my command miniatures, I am a sucker for them. 
Lots of fun stuff here. Lots of cool minis. Hopefully, I remember that, the crocodile. They had some really solid stuff in this game. They had beer, man beer pig. They had some really solid things that I am really excited for. I did not get the metal dice because metal dice, I have, uh, speaking of uh, village attacks, village attacks had metal dice and I just wasn't interested in them. I found them to be chunky and annoying and I was intimidated by throwing them. They do have Danny Trejo. Oh my gosh. I love, I love, I was so excited when I watched the Zombicide video and I saw Danny Trejo, who I think, I think I'm saying his name correctly, uh, you know, in the video and then he became a character. It, I, I love that guy. He is a a solid solid personality uh, i don't actually know him at all obviously but he, yeah there are people who you like more and the people who you like less when it comes to celebrities and he falls into the like more category he's got a personality which i appreciate and that's going to take us to chronicles of Jornagar: age of darkness chronicles of Jornagar. i think i did a i'm pretty sure i did a late back on this one too i, I it's, it's time flies i and i i lose focus i lose touch with my pre-content creation life and my post-content creation life sometimes i sometimes those lines blur but i believe i did do a chronicles of Jonagar age of darkness and the reason i believe i did that is because i remember jeremy howard prince of a man that he is commenting on my video and that that makes me feel special i love you jeremy you're a great man in any case going back to chronicles of Jonagar, so i i think i'm picking this up from jesse jesse has this thing where he's not shy at all about about basically talking about how attracted he is and how he'll, different men he'll marry and all that. And I think I'm just picking up from Jesse all this all this 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 bromancing. In any case, Chronicles of Dronagar, Age of Darkness, and Jesse, by the way, for those who don't know, is Quackalope. J Jesse Anderson from the channel Quackalope, who I do a lot of stuff with. In any case, Chronicles of Dronagar, Age of Darkness is a fully cooperative dungeon crawler, and it's one that I am excited for. I think it has campaign elements to it. I can't recall perfectly. It's just all these things blurred together, but it is one that I am excited about. The miniatures, they have slowly been teasing photos. The miniatures look great, which is particularly nice, given that the very first photo they teased of the miniatures was more than subpar and was a mistake to tease, in my opinion. It made it look not... It, it put people on their toes, reasonably so. But the miniatures actually do look great. The upgrading system looks amazing. I remember being a backer in this campaign and I was a fairly vocal backer not I was not abusive I don't believe in being abusive in Kickstarter campaigns and fortunately I want to say that I have generally held true, true, true to that myself I usually am polite but firm when I am expressing a viewpoint different than a creator and this is both pre and post content creation and I was polite but firm but the fact that I was turned off by the change to the player boards and they, they basically end up solving that problem by giving players both the new and the old player boards so you can enjoy both ways whatever you prefer which is a fun compromise to make and it comes at a, a sacrifice look here's jaheen or jeremy howard but it's, it certainly comes at a sacrifice to to give up some of your vision but they they had made the mistake of changing something that people liked after people back the game it's a tough kickstarter is a messy messy business to be in ultimately chronicles of Nergar had an interesting exploration mode with this whole door system it had this 3d terrain that made it look interesting it had gorgeous miniatures it had upgrades and abilities and character development and those are things that i love Chronicles of Dronagar is going to be, whenever I do these lists of the games I'm most excited to get next, Chronicles of Dronagar is going to join that list. Alter Quest is now here, I can experience it, the whole hype and excitement is, is gone, I mean, it's still here, but it's, the excitement of getting it is gone, and now I have to play it and experience it, and then it'll either be a letdown, or it'll be like, oh, I'm so excited, I love it, because if it's anywhere in the middle, it will it will be gone, unfortunately. Uh, but Chronicles of Dronagar is going to be one of those next ones where I'm super hyped, super excited, super interested, because just the sheer amount of upgrading and abilities is is tempting. It, it calls to who I am. It calls to who I am. It calls to what I like in board games. And so Chronicles of Dronagar, that is basically one that I have on my backlog. And by the way, I haven't said this yet, but in case you're wondering, I'm going in terms of the oldest to newest in terms of how far back. Each of these videos covers the 10 or 11 oldest Kickstarter campaigns before I get to the new ones. Uh, this one's going to be, I think, 10 plus the Ever Rain, which should have been in last ones. Then we have Titans, historical fantasy miniature board game, which doesn't seem like it funded that long ago, but it also funded before I ever did any content creation, which means it must have funded that long ago. It's, like I said, time flies when you're having fun. People, my wife used to ask me before I started this, when I first started getting sucked into Kickstarter, my wife started asking me, like, why are you getting excited about something you're not going to see a year out? But now I'm two years out, and I've started to see them. i started to get a lot of them. Some of them have become some of my favorite games. Some of them are, you know, move on. And either way, and I have, a, again, videos. I always have videos planned. But I have a whole video planned talking about how Kickstarter games really are not flash in the pan. There are so many ones that are amazing. And I'm happy to go through the ones that aren't as long as I can get my money back to get to the ones that are amazing. 
and Titans. Titans is one I probably shouldn't have backed, because this one fell into the category, honestly, I backed this game because of Sam Healy. Sam Healy, if you watch this, maybe I'll send it to you, I don't know. Sam Healy, if you watch this, I backed Titans specifically and exclusively because of you. Although exclusively is probably a hard word, but I was ready to walk away from this game because this game, what it was promising me, it was promising me an experience similar to Blood Rage, some degree of area control, some degree of combat, some degree of fun stuff going on in a non-dungeon crawl game, but rather a fi fighting combat-based game. And this, for me, I was promised a, a Blood Rage-style game, not necessarily Blood Rage itself, obviously it's going to be different, but it was Sam Healy and his quotes or testimonials at some convention that he played this game and he seemed to be excited about it. And I know that Sam Healy's number one game of all time, like myself, is Blood Rage. You and I, Sam, me and you against the world. Again, romance stuff. Uh, but anyways, this game, Titans, I was ready to walk away from it. I was, why am I paying so much money? And it wasn't a ton, but it was like, oh, it was 100 euros, something like that. It was 100 pounds. It's a lot of money. And I was backing this game for the promise of a potential Blood Rage competitor. Why don't I just wait? Pick it up in the second hand market. Pay a premium if I need to. Why am I taking this risk? And it was Sam Healy. Sam Healy is why I took this risk. So this game, you can exclusively blame to Sam Healy being excited about the game, to Sam Healy seeming to care about the game. The miniatures, they have these gigantic titans that I'm sure will be great. The rest of the miniatures, I'm kind of expecting them to be a letdown. Whenever you have miniatures, you always have to... It takes a certain amount of time before you can realize which ones are more likely to look eh once you get them and which ones are more likely to look exciting. And size is going to be a factor there. It's not the only thing, but even if you just look at the level of detail on the big ones with the small ones, I'm excited about all this stuff. But I'm, I'm not, I didn't back this game for the miniatures. This is not one where I backed it for the miniatures. This is one where I backed this game because of Sam Healy. Which brings us to Arceus. This is one that I almost didn't back. And I, I did. I don't know who I can blame for this one. Not Sam Healy. This wasn't from Sam. This is one that I, I was on the fence about. When it came out, I was still going through my Kickstarter addiction. I'm still in my Kickstarter addiction. And... I was tempted, but I, I pulled back. I wasn't as interested in it. And actually, this one had a slow burn, if I recall correctly. It didn't really jump up right away. It was, it barely funded initially. And then it managed to cross over 300,000 euro, but it was a slow burn. And Uncommon kept releasing more stuff, more miniatures, more aspects. It, this one is a campaign game with legacy-like elements. I believe there are ways you can make it non-destructible or maybe you get a second kit. There were some compromises they made to make it more reusable. But it really came down to the fact that there were a lot of key names in this game. Antoine Boza, who was it? We have a lot of people. We had Antoine Boza, we had more people. There was more. A three new game by team, a quarantine, I thought it was more. Ludovic Malblanc and Theo River, I thought it was more people that I recognized. So Antoine Boza, I guess, that was the main one who I, must have been my pull for me. And it was, a, it had this, it had dungeon crawl elements, a cooperative aspect to it, uh, with a theme that is fairly unique, or at least fairly unique and having been done well. I mean, there's a handful of games, there's an Adventures, Temple of Horus, whatever it is, there are a handful of games that pull this theme in. Uh, perhaps one day I'll do a full video on why I should, why I backed it, but I, I try to save those for things that are, well available to actually back, and this one is not, or I don't believe it is at least. In any case, this one had a lot of miniatures that were amazing, it had a campaign play that looked accessible, that's the key thing that I look for with campaign, campaign plays, and it had a legacy element, I'm actually a fan of legacy elements, to me a legacy elements drive me forward in games. Pandemic Legacy, or any legacy game, I have actually finished. Campaign games, I have not. Something about the legacy narrative aspect to things pushes me forward, causing me to complete the game sooner, especially if it's something I can play with my wife as opposed to my game group, because my wife and I, we can play a game every night. My game group and I, we play a game a few times a week, maybe, if we're lucky. Probably twice a week, I don't know. In any case, that would be Arcaeus. Arcaeus? Arcaeus? I don't know if I'm saying it correctly. Probably Arcaeus. I'm going to go with Arcaeus. Sounds good. And look at these buildings. Look, at they have the, the 3D terrain element. It looked good. It looked good. But I'm a sucker for bad decisions, as you well know. And then we have the, the Great Wall board game. And this is one where the Great Wall board game, it just sounds bad the way it says. It should be The Great Wall. Not Great Wall board game. The Great Wall. I should not read from the text. The Great Wall is one that I did another video on. This is going to be Awakened Realms, which is exciting time. ISS Vanguard is coming out soon, and people are getting excited. I'm getting excited, I can tell you that much. Etherfields just arrived. I have Etherfields before I have Tainted Grail. I should never choose one wave shipping again. That is a huge mistake. Huge mistake. Mea culpa. My bad. I should know better. I do know better now. But the Great Wall is one that I backed, and I'm not excited about it. But I am excited about it at the same time. I did a full video on this. The short version is half the reason I backed this was for my kids. The other half was because Awaken Realms makes games that generally hold their value. And so this one, I believe, is no exception. I believe this will hold its value. It may not hold its value to the degree that some other games of theirs have, but I backed it on the chance that it's good. And it is a risk. Semi-co-op with a, a different style worker placement. This is not Awakened Realms' typical genre. And so it could be amazing. It could be that they introduce new things and push the genre forward. Or it could be that sometimes 
not every game from every company is going to be amazing. And I don't know where the Great Wall lands. But for me, I backed it because it had amazing miniatures that my kids love. My kids love this theme. And so I was like, you know what? I will go for it. I think I even got the mini pack. I, did I get the meeple pack? I think I went back in after the fact and added the meeple pack so I have both. And that way, if I sell the game, I can just give them the meeples. 20 bucks for who knows how many meeples. I pay far more than that for Lego and Playmobil. They'll, they can enjoy these. And so if the game is great, excellent. I have a great game and I they, my kids will love playing with it. And if it's not great, then my kids will get the next game. And this one will be sold and moved on and I'll get my money back. But I'm not willing to pay whatever way I pay 200 pounds. I'm not willing to pay 200 pounds to have a game that my kids will play with the mini miniatures. But I am willing to pay 200 pounds knowing I'll get it all back if it's not a good game. And if it is a good game, I'm happy to have it in my collection. So that's really the Great Wall. Cool miniatures, interesting theme, a, a, a drift, a gap from a Awakened Realm's usual genre, a risk to be certain, one that I am not excited about. I am not. But there are many games in my collection that I was not excited about and have become some of my favorite games. Rurik Dawn of Kiev, one of my favorite games of all time, top 10 material, is a game that I wasn't excited about until I pulled it out, read the rulebook, and set it up, and even then, I expected it to be let down. I expected it to be like, well, this looks actually better than I thought, but it will be outshunned by Innis, it will be outshunned by Lancaster. How could it possibly hold its own in a crowded field? And yet, yet it is there, holding its own in a crowded field. Which brings us to Divinity Original Sin. Divinity Original Sin is another one that I did a full video on. The last one, we have one more after this. The last one I didn't do a full video on. At least I don't think I did. Again, it all blurs together. It's just, just having fun. Divinity Original Sin is one that I did a full video on. And I am simultaneously excited about it. And also campaign play. And I don't know if this will make the cut. I'm still excited, to be clear. But like any of the other campaign games on this list, it's going to have to meet a higher bar than if it were not a campaign game because of the fact that it represents a commitment, a commitment that I am only willing to, I'm willing to keep these games on my shelf. To be clear, when it comes to campaign games, I'm willing to say, I'll give it a few missions, now it appeals to me, and then I will potentially hold on to it forever. Not actually forever, but for a long time. There's a certain degree of, of buffer that if I like a game, I don't mind holding on to it for the eventual promise that I will one day play it. But if the campaign games are slowly building up on my shelves faster than I can get rid of them, that represents a problem. Divinity Original Sin represented a different kind of campaign game, not a full dungeon crawl, but rather this interesting card-based system where you have gigantic miniatures that really just go on the cards as a com complete thematic disconnect. It might be a complete bust of a game, or it might be really good. I don't really know. I think this one is less of a safe back than many of the other games that I have backed, but I think it's likely to do well. I think it's likely to have... I mean, they have the amount of content they have, the amount of cards they have, the story they have, the, the PC game reliability. I mean, this is going to fall, but this potentially falls into the same zone as Dark Souls, in the sense that even if it's not as good as it ideally should be, it potentially will have a lot of resale value because there's enough people who aren't in the board game space who are happy to jump in on this, who see this, and they're like, that is amazing, that's incredible. Because by the standards of someone who's not playing the games that we are, it might be better. So it only has to meet a certain bar. It has to meet a bar of general goodness for it to hold its value. It doesn't have to be absolutely amazing. Now, if it is absolutely amazing, it will stay on my shelf. I don't get rid of games that represent the promise of a true exploration, of a true experience. I only am 7th seventh, seventh, uh, Continent, which I still haven't gotten rid of. I'm only considering getting rid of because 7th Citadel does the same thing but better for me. So maybe I'll get rid of that one because even though it represents so much promise, I have gone through the promise a few times. I have had a few missions, a few scenarios. I've played, I've sunk a good 10 to 15 hours of my life in 7th Continent. And I don't mind getting rid of it if 7th Citadel does the same thing but better. But I think I would, not I think, I know I would still own 7th Continent if 7th Citadel didn't do the same thing but better. And so different experiences, different aspects to the promise that these games represent, they are worth experiencing, they are worth potentially having it's just the promise overlaps at a certain point do you really need madara and gloomhaven and osworn how much overlap do you need in the potential that a game gives you do i need tainted grail plus seven citadel i don't know i may well get tainted grail and say screw that i don't need seven citadel either there's a degree of potential that i want on my shelves a degree of promise a degree of of other worlds the same way people might have a book collection but i want it to be narrow enough that it represents the best of the best in whatever it is trying to do and Divinity Original Sin has an edge in that sense in that it is different, or it seems to be different in the way, in the presentation, in the experience and delivery of what they do. Now, that different could work for them, or it could work against them. I don't really know, and time will tell. And lastly on this list, we have Unsettled. 
Unsettled by Orange Nebula. This, this is one that I went back and forth on heavily. In fact, I ended this one at a $1 pledge, didn't back it, and eventually went in on the pledge manager and upgraded. Eventually. And, and the whole reasoning there is because, on the one hand, there wasn't enough information for me about how this game played for me to truly sink my teeth into or for me to even feel like it was something that I would enjoy and love. I don't know where this game was. I still don't know if this game is going to be amazing. All these seals, though, are for Vindication. Vindication is one of my favorite games. I experienced it first time in January 2020, I want to say. Was it trying? I think it was January 2020. But I experienced this one this year, Vindication, and I love Vindication. It is so amazingly... It's, it's amazingly amazing, okay? That's what it is. I love Vindication. It is a solid, solid experience. And if Orange Nebula was able to deliver another game like that, I, I back this game because of Vindication. I back this game because of the promise of what that could be. And, of course, the colors, the gorgeous. They, they make pretty games, and they make good games. Or they make good game, I guess, in theory. And time will tell if they make good games. So I'm excited about Unsettled. I am. But I'm not I'm not excited the same way I am for the Chronicles of Drenagar, where I know what experience I am potentially getting my hands on. Rather, I am excited for Unsettled because of the potential promise of what Unsettled might be for me. To which I have no idea. I don't I don't know what this will deliver. But I'm excited. Because because of vindication. Because you make a game good enough and you are on my radar until you until you deliver a bad experience. So that's that's unsettled. I don't I don't even know where they are in fulfillment. I don't remember where they left off. We'll see. Journey before destination. I don't know. I'm excited for this game. The colors are beautiful. This looks like Vindication. It looks like it has that same style, that same genre, the same whatever. Not same genre. Same visual graphic design. And we'll see how it plays out. That's my list. Ten games, eleven games, whatever it is. Plus, of course, the recap from the beginning. We'll do another one of these in a month or so, whenever there's a light week and I have another backlog. But I, I like going through these, giving you a, an experience, a taste. To a certain degree, you know who I am. To a certain ex extent, you watch my videos, you know what I back. I cover all that, but you don't know what I backed in the past. And I know that before I was a content creator, I used to watch people. The people who I watched, I would want to see what did you like? What did you keep in your collection? What worked for you? There's a degree of familiarity, of uh, 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 of almost not, not intimacy, but, uh, but the knowledge that... Oh, I like your content, and I know that we align on this. Like, like Sam Healy. Sam Healy, who I, I share his taste in games. I want to know, I still want to know, what is Sam Healy backing? What games is he adding to his collection as Kickstarter goes on? Because because I know that his tastes align with mine, and so so I like I like having that, that confirmation bias of, well, if you backed it, I'll jump in. This is a trick I use to this date. I have, I have this little running game with a Successful Geek. Successful Geek is a, one of my viewers, and I have this running game with him where... Both of us seem to be on the fence about a lot of the same campaigns, and we have pushed each other to back games and then pushed each other to walk away from games. We both agreed to cancel our Bardsung pledges together. We both agreed to not cancel Bardsung. I think Bardsung is the newest one. We've agreed to cancel DEI to not back that one. We've agreed to cancel Bardsung. We've agreed to go in on Dark Ventures. We're using ourselves as this leverage to push ourselves in different directions because there's enough overlap in what we like and there's enough overlap in our FOMO that we use each other as, as crutches, for better and for worse. And so I like... I like sharing that to a degree as well, although technically this video is all about the games I did back, so there's no crutches here. It's just an insight to what I did, didn't do, all that stuff. Until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And I'll see you in a month with the next one of these, somewhere about a month. Until next time, have a good one.